Well hi folks and welcome to our service for the 19th of September. I hope you are all well. Uh, I just have a couple of notices quickly. The first is to say that we're still working our way through the new guidelines from the Church of Scotland and from the Scottish Government regarding Covid and how life and church life is going to be over the next little while. I want the folks who are watching this though, whether you're watching on YouTube or whether you're listening on the phone line, to know uh, that we do plan to continue with this at least till the end of the year. Uh, so don't be worried if you're someone who really will be having to continue in this way for now. Um, th this will not disappear soon. So I hope that helps. We'll be in touch with other more things. The best way really to know what's going on is to be signed up for the church's weekly email, which we're continuing for now. And if you don't already get that, please just send an email to info at pontleytownchurch.org.uk I-N-F-O at pontleytownchurch.org.uk And then secondly, some sad news, I'm afraid, from our congregation. One of our dearly loved members, Betty Henderson, died this past week. Folks might have known that Betty has, has struggled since her knee operation over a year ago, just before COVID actually. And it's sad for us to lose someone who was so important to the church. Um, I genuinely believe that she was one of the most important people in our church and someone who demonstrated extremely clearly what it is to be a Christian. Maybe folks who don't know the church too well or know Betty might be surprised if you know who she is. But she is someone who, in her whole life, and in a manner of different ways, uh, served God. She loved Jesus Christ. She gave her time and her energy and her money and her gifts to the church to serve people and to serve us as an organisation. So we're so thankful to God for Betty. Her funeral service is going to be on Wednesday at 2pm. That's this Wednesday coming at 2pm at Pontley Town Church and everyone from the church is welcome to come along to that. So... Uh, sad news, it's sad for us to lose someone we love so dearly, but as Christians we do not grieve without hope. We have a hope that Betty is now with her Saviour, Jesus Christ, and now will be free of pain and free of trouble and will only know joy from now until eternity. Well, these are our notices, let's begin with our first song.
Lord Jesus Christ, you are indeed that glorious Redeemer, the one who has loosed us from the slavery of sin, redeeming us at the cost of your own blood at the cross, satisfying the wrath of the Father in our place and washing us clean. How we love you and how we adore you for how freely you gave yourself for us. How we praise you that this was not just some mere happenstance but part of that wonderful, glorious, eternal plan of you and the Father and the Spirit together which has been from eternity and is yet being fulfilled. We thank you that you are the one who has embraced us into his glorious kingdom of light. We love you and we adore you and we ask that as we worship together in this way you would draw near us today by your Holy Spirit. You would speak to us through your word of yourself and you would build us up as your people. Lord Jesus, how you know we face so many trials and difficult things in our lives and we find it so easy to wander so easy to be those who turn back to our old ways of life and sinful paths. And in fact, we want to confess these things before you today. We are sorry for our sin and we are sorry for all that we have done which has dishonoured you. Lead us forward, we ask. Cleanse us from our guilt and our sin. Help us to know your forgiveness. And give us strength to live anew for you this week to come. Lives full of obedience and holiness. Lives which are for your glory and for your fame alone. We ask that you would help us individually and we also ask that you would continue to help us as a congregation. We pray for those who are struggling at the moment in different ways. We pray especially today for those who are grieving the loss of Betty we ask, Lord God, that you would comfort their hearts. We thank you that for Betty there is now a greater joy, for she is beholding you in your face now forever. Yeah, we ask that even as we grieve, you would spur us on in that hope, that that would be our hope too. We ask too that you would be helping our congregation to stand fast and true in times of trial and temptation, that we would be growing all the time in our faith and hope and love together. Lord Jesus, will we be a people that shine your light and the light of your grace and your love, which you have shone into our lives, to all those around us, in our words and in our deeds. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Our Bible reading today is taken from 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 9 to 24. In the twentieth year of Jeroboam king of Israel, Asa became king of Judah, and he reigned in Jerusalem for forty-one years. His grandmother's name was Maka, daughter of Abishalom. David, sorry, Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord as his father David had done. He expelled the male shrine prostitutes from the land and got rid of all the idols his ancestors had made. He even deposed his grandmother Maka from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive image for the worship of Asherah. Asa cut down and burned it in the Kidron Valley. Although he did not remove the high places, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. He brought into the temple of the Lord the silver and gold and the articles that he and his father had dedicated. There was war between Asa and Besha, king of Israel, through their reigns. Basha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and fortified Ramah to prevent anyone from leaving or entering the territory of Asa, king of Judah. 
Asa then took all the silver and gold that was left in the treasuries of the Lord's temple and of his own palace. He entrusted it to his officials and sent them to Ben-Hadad, son of tab son of Hesion, the king of Aram, who was ruling in Damascus. Let there be a treaty between me and you, he said, as there was between my father and your father. See, I am sending you a gift of silver and gold. Now break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. Ben-Hadad agreed with King Asa and sent the commanders of his forces against the towns of Israel. He conquered Ejun, Dad, Abel, Beth, Maka, and all Kinnereth, in addition to Naphtali. When Basha heard this, he stopped building Ramah and withdrew to Terza. And King Asa issued an order to all Judah. No one was exempt, and they carried away from Ramah the stones and timber Basha had been using there. With them, King Asa built up Geba in Benjamin, and also Mizpah. As for all the other events of Asa's reign, all his achievements, and all the cities he built, are they not written in the books of the annals of the kings of Judah? In his old age, however, his feet became diseased. Then Asa rested with his ancestors, and he was buried with them in the city of his father David, and Jehoshaphat, his son, succeeded him as king. Well, I'm sure you've been noticing with me that we're getting to that stage in the year where light is becoming a factor and a thing. You'll notice that the evenings are drawing in. If I'm going out in the evening and there's no one in the house, I have to make sure the light is on. Otherwise, the poor dog ends up being in darkness. And light is an important image we have in the Bible. It's an image of how God often works, of who God is. And the theme of light and darkness is seen right through the different parts of the story of the great story of redemption. As we continue today to look at the kings, we've been looking at this time of darkness. But I'm encouraged that today, as we look at King Asa, there is finally, it seems, some light. Let me just catch us up with the story if you've not been following along. We've been looking at the kingdom of Israel in some dark days. The kingdom is split north and south. We looked at King Jeroboam in the north and then King Rehoboam in the south and then his son Abijah. And here today we're now looking at another king in the south, in Judah. One who is described to us in our passage last week as a lamp in Jerusalem. And we're going to see something about his story, about what God was doing in those days. And how I want to spend our time today is that the first half will be simply going through the story of King Asa, according to this chapter. And then in the second half of my message, I want to share with you what this can teach us today as Christians about shining. But first, let's hear the story. Well, in the story we see that Asa is a lamp that shines in the darkness, even if it flickers at times. In verse 11, we read this statement that brings great joy to us as we've been following along this story. A deep relief that Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his father David had done. On one hand, this might not seem that big a statement. I mean, after all, that's what the kings were supposed to be. But that has not been the way. Successive kings have not just not trusted God and obeyed God, but have gone their own way. And in fact, last week we saw that these practices of relation in relation to worship had got so bad 
that we see that the detestable things, the abominable things, the worst things that were warned against in God's law had been done, not just in one place, but all over Judah. Things were bad. But now Asa, a king who trusts God, has come. And that will mean change. It means that Asa has to expel the male cultish prostitutes, tear down the Asherah poles. These very things that are so angering to God. And you might think, well, that seems a bit extreme, doesn't it? These reforms. Why did he have to go so far? But there are some things that are so important that they need serious action. After all, do you remember Jesus in the temple? Clearing it? Throwing out the money changers? Do you remember what he said to the Pharisees, who to everyone else seemed quite respectable religious leaders? Once he discerned that their heart was so far from God, Jesus called them, amongst other things, a breed of vipers. You see, sometimes there needs to be strong condemnation of sin, especially in the church, and especially in relation to the wrong worship of God. Otherwise, how would we know how serious it is? Well, that's what he does. He kicks out these folks involved in these false practices. And he continues, there's no one who is not part of this. Even the Queen Mother herself is kicked out from her position for her part in this wrong and sin. And so, as we read, read this in a strange way, I think we should be warned because here's a king who's really following God's law with all his heart, with no prejudice, no bias, no special deals for those close to him. This is the kind of king you can get behind, isn't it? However, as we read on, we see that as good as King Ace's reforms are, and they are good, they are not absolute. He seems not to be able to tear down the high places, these DIY sites of worship that are so against God's law. Why? Well, we don't really know. The text is ambiguous. Is it perhaps that he met such opposition that he couldn't carry on? Is it perhaps that he didn't follow these reforms with zeal all his life? Is it just that there's only so much one good king can do after a succession of bad kings? We don't know. What we do know, though, is that there's obviously goodness in this reign. This really is a lamp shining in darkness. We're assured a second time that Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord his God. Not just in words, but in deeds. Did you notice these the silver and gold and other articles that were dedicated to God were taken from the palace to the temple. They're not there to line his pockets, they're there to be God's. So this is a good reign, but hints that there are limits. And we see that more as we look at his political manoeuvres. Now maybe if when I was reading there about these things in verses 16 to 19, you may have thought that they would have seemed a little complicated, kind of hard to understand. I confess, right at the beginning when I was studying this, I found it a wee bit difficult to understand what was going on. And I'm very thankful for, among others, the book of Bob Fio that helped me cut through this and understand this a bit. Let me have a go at trying to explain it. You have to remember, first of all, that this kingdom of Israel is split, Israel to the north and Judah to the south. We are talking about King Asa in the south, and there's King Basha in the north. And what King Basha does is he fortifies the city of Ramah, which is about six miles from Jerusalem and is on the border between Israel and Judah. What he's basically doing is creating a hard border between the two, controlling who and what is coming in and out of Judah. Of course, that's a threat to Judah. So, Asa decides to take action. And in the action he decides to take is really using that age-old tactic of saying, well, my enemy's enemy is my friend. 
he goes and gives a bribe, although it's translated gift in our translation, to the king of Syria. And the king of Syria outflanks the king of Israel, having said, well, I'll go quite happily with the highest bidder. He breaks off the treaty with the north, attacks, Basha has to run, and what's left is the building materials which Asa seems then to use to fortify his strongholds to the south. Well, all in all, it seems militarily to be a very successful enterprise, politically expedient, the kind of thing that kings usually are praised for. And yet there are hints, I think, that it's not maybe quite as straightforward, is it? Of course, that's always true of politics, isn't it? Politics is never straightforward. War is never straightforward. Things in the real world are always a bit messier. I think we have to say that on the one hand, Asa is effective and on the whole, the passage is neutral. There's not an explicit comment of negativity in what he does. But there are these hints that make me hesitate. You see, that word that is gift that should probably be translated bribe is a big one. The fact that the king of Syria has to then break off a treaty, a covenant, which the Bible never looks down well on, happens. The fact that this money that was poured into the temple before, the silver and gold, is now poured into Syria, seems unwise. There's a parallel account of the same story in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, and in that, Asa is rebuked and criticised. Because he's told that if only he would have turned to God, then he would have had the king of Syria handed over to him. And there's a hint then, I think, that he's been wasteful, that he's given all the money of Judah to a foreign king for protection, when he could have trusted God and he would have kept the money and he would have been given the king. And so as we try and add all this up together, let's just try and think about what is it we're being told about King Asa? We're told at the beginning this is a 41-year reign, and yet the author of Kings really is just giving us two little episodes, which I think emphasise the same point, that here we do have a lamp compared to those before and compared to those after. One who follows the Lord and trusts him and is blessed not just with a long reign, but on the whole effectiveness in religious reforms and in political manoeuvres. But there's a sense in which he's limited. There's also this sense in which he is not quite able to do everything we'd hoped. And of course that's true, isn't it, of every reign, even the best reign, human reign, even the best ministry, even the best person. They're never perfect. We always would want them just to be a bit better. Well, what can we learn from this then for ourselves today? Well, I think firstly we can see for us that we can shine because there is a greater light because of the light of the world. Today we've been thinking about Asa, a lamp that flickered. He shone into the darkness of that day, yes, but he was limited in what he could do even in a 40-year reign. Sadly, as we'll see next week, there was darkness before him and there'll be darkness after him. But there was one who came after him, much further down the line of David, a greater king, who was not called a lamp, but a light, Jesus, who was not limited in his reign, limited in his effect, 
In fact, we're told in John's Gospel that he is the light of the world. Not a reflected light. Not a, a light, a lamp that needs oil and runs out. Not an electric bulb that needs to be powered to, to shine. He himself is light, we're told. And he came not just to a nation at one time, but came to be the light of the world for all who would receive him. John tells us in the Gospel that he wrote that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There's so much in that statement. But if you just think about this theme of darkness and light and think about Jesus' journey from before his birth until after his resurrection, there is an amazing thing. Jesus always dwelled in inapproachable light, but yet he plunged down into darkness. He drew alongside us, exactly. He didn't just come to expose us, although he did, showed us what was good and light and bad and dark. He came to take on the darkness. He came to defeat evil and sin. And he died in darkness at the cross, offering himself for us. But because the light overcomes the darkness, he broke that dark thing of death and rose again, and now dwells again in inapproachable light, enthroned on high in heaven. And we're told that in his coming and living and dying and rising again, Jesus has established a kingdom, a forever kingdom. A kingdom, Paul says, of light, which we, if we are in him, have been qualified for by the Father, that we can have a place in. And by this, not only will he expose our darkness and change it to light, he is changing us to be more like him, more like the light. The light overcomes the dark. The light has shone in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Because of him, if we are in him, if we believe in him and trust in him, then we can shine today. Whatever our circumstances are, whatever darkness is around us or whatever darkness we see in us, we can shine. And do you see how important that is? See, I'm not saying, I'm not saying Asa shone brightly in a dark time and we can have a go-to if we try really hard. Because even... The best of us aren't as gifted as Asa, and we wouldn't even get as far as that. No, instead we see that Jesus is the light who has overcome the darkness. He has given us a place in his kingdom of light, and wants us to shine with his light and his goodness, and his strength and his power. That is the power that has overcome evil and sin. That can shine into a sinful and broken world around us we can shine because we have the light of the world maybe you're watching today and you you wouldn't be sure exactly where you are in terms of Christianity and maybe you look at the world as it is and you see darkness you see darkness outside of you in the world and inside of you maybe you've given up thinking that there's good goodness true goodness true light in this world but the Bible's claim is that there is one who is light, who can overcome your darkness, the darkness of your sin, the darkness of yourself, the darkness around you, even the darkness of death, if you would trust him. You need first to let him shine, let him expose you, painful as that is, to show that you really are darker than you realise, but that he is the one who can overcome that darkness. He is the one who can welcome you into his kingdom, make you part of his new people and welcome you not just now and shine his light now and through you to others, but that he will receive you in light 
for eternity. We can shine because there is a light of the world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And secondly, and finally for our video today, I want us to see that we can shine even when it's hard. Asa lived in a time of decline in the Old Testament church. Before him was a dark downward spiral, and after him there was a dark downward spiral. Today we often recognise that in our nation and in denomination we feel something of that similar spiral, a spiritual decline. And I think for us, at the times at least, that decline feels almost overwhelming and it almost paralyses us. We can feel defeated. Last week we thought about that a bit, didn't we, when we thought about how we live in times of bronze rather than gold now. But I want to encourage us as Christians to keep shining. We can still shine. And you know, a little light makes a big difference. And a little light makes a bigger difference in darker times. Do you remember Jesus said of his followers in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead they put it on its stand and give its light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to live and to shine for Jesus and make an immense difference. Where I, where I grew up, as I've said before, is the Isle of Arran, and there there was no street lamps, and there was large gaps between the villages. But I remember that on a dark night, you could walk home from Blackwaterfoot, the village I lived in, which was Shiskin, and you could do it by the moon, if it was out. That was just a small light, really, in a very dark place, reflected, not its own light, but it was enough to guide us home. In the same way, we can live for Jesus and shine for him. We can do it whatever we're facing, whether we feel we have a lot or a little, because really we're only reflecting the light of Christ. Whether our life is easy or whether our life is hard, whatever it is we're going through, we can shine. Yet we might not be doing such obviously amazing things as Asa in a 41-year reign, but where you are this week, you can shine. And you can shine even when it's hard. A little light can make a big difference. And the darker it gets, the bigger an impact a small light makes. So let's shine the light of Christ. Let's walk in obedience to him. Let's keep acknowledging and witnessing to him before others. Let's do all this that people may glorify our Father in heaven. Jesus said.
Well, thanks folks for watching our video today. I hope you have a good week. Please keep in touch and let us know how you're getting on. And there'll be more details of church life in the weekly email coming in the next day or two. Thanks very much.